talk today will be given by uh, Dr. Peter Hatfield. He's a junior research fellow at Wilson College. Um, and he's made an interesting transition from uh, working in astrophysics to, to nuclear fusion. And today he'll talk about uh, using machine learning uh, uh, for high temperature and density plasma physics, which is applicable uh, to both uh, fields. Uh, Peter, please uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming on to, to listen. Uh, and thank you very much to the organizers for uh, organizing this and inviting me to give a talk. Um, so my research, uh, 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 as he says, I'm a postdoc in, in uh, the department uh, and I've worked in both the astrophysics department and atomic and laser and are very interested in kind of building uh, um, links between the kind of two areas of interest. Um, most of the work I'm going to present uh, today is done in collaboration with uh, various other people around Oxford uh, as this year uh, and a few other people uh, in the UK and around the world, uh, in particular Ibrahim uh, Al Muslam in Saudi Arabia. So uh, thank you very much to all my collaborators who uh, contributed to all the work presented here as well. Uh, so the kind of main uh, thing I'm kind of going to focus on in this talk is how you can combine theory and data. Uh, theoretical models and data-driven models to give improved predictions of the kind of physics problems. Uh, so I'm going to discuss the kind of background of two, two particular case studies uh, that I've kind of explored these methods for. Uh, and I'm going to explore kind of the sort of basic machine learning regression as kind of applied to these, these problems and kind of how, how well that does it making predictions. Uh, and I'm going to talk about how you can kind of combine uh, theoretical predictions with data-driven models to kind of give improved overall um, predictions uh, and finally I'm going to talk about kind of few small uh, small uh, smaller projects that kind of link together uh, this idea to the wider wider area so the kind of two two areas of physics that, are, that uh, I'm kind of going to be drawing on are uh, firstly uh, high powered lasers um, so these are kind of um, football football pitch sized lasers uh, that focus huge amounts of energy onto kind of very small small sized pieces of plasma uh, and these are the kind of two things you might be interested in using these for. Is, one is laboratory astrophysics, so creating a, a millimeter sized plasma with the, the temperature and same temperature and density as inside the sun, um, and kind of learning more about uh, that in that way. Uh, or you might also want to use these lasers for a nuclear fusion as a power source, so he's using the lasers to heat up the plasma uh, to get nuclear reactions. This is kind of one of two main ways to nuclear fusion as a power source. Um, there's the kind of tokamak method, which um, is kind of uh, investigated at JET near Oxford, uh, and this is the kind of other other main pathway inertial confinement fusion. So the kind of specific problem uh, within that is for an inertial confinement fusion, can you predict the energy, the number, and the energy is given out in neutrons? How many neutrons? How much energy the experiment gives out as a function of kind of all the parameters that define the design of the experiment, basically. And the kind of other large area of physics is uh, large astronomical surveys, so uh, statistical studies of large numbers of astronomical uh, bodies. So um, you might have a survey that looks at large numbers of galaxies. Um, and the kind of specific problem within that that we'd like to know is, uh, can you predict the redshift of a, of a galaxy? Uh, so this is what these kind of high-powered lasers look like. Uh, this is the National Ignition Facility, uh, which is kind of the sort of world, world's premier high, high-powered laser. Um, and you can see it's absolutely huge, several several billion dollars uh, construction and a sort of several decade project. Um, this is what a kind of classic experiment looks like on it. There's kind of uh, loads of variations on it, but kind of uh, base version of the, exp of the uh, experiments that you might do on, on NIF uh, are, look like a little capsule that's about a millimetre in radius uh, that kind of has a kind of solid shell and then it has deuterium tritium sort of painted uh, frozen deuterium tritium painted on the inside and then it's kind of hollow with deuterium deuterium tritium gas at a lower density on the inside and that's kind of inside a kind of gold uh, cylinder and then the kind of lasers uh, kind of shot in through the through the top and then there's kind of lots of lots of complex physics that goes on and hopefully you get um, more energy out than you put in um, so we'd like to be able to predict how much energy you get out of them um, the kind of other experiments that you might do do on, on NIF are these laboratory astrophysics experiments. So I've just given some sort of uh, uh, pretty pictures there of, of some experiments. Um, uh, Professor um, Gregory's group, group uh, do are kind of a very good players in this and do lots of very interesting work on uh, studying, for example, magnetic um, dynamo uh, in the lab of sort of how 
uh, turbulent magnetic fields might form magnetic fields that you see in the universe. Uh, and you can also do things like measure the equation of state um, that you would you would find at the centre of um, kind of Jupiter style exoplanets uh, in the lab. So we'd like to be able to predict, as a function of the design parameters, uh, how much energy you're going to get out of the experiment. Um, basically, ideally with error bars, and hopefully this lets you, is going to let you do new experiments with a higher yield, um, so that hopefully you can kind of reach the stage that you're getting more energy out than you put in. Um, and if you can't do that, then hopefully uh, your kind of predictive power increases so that you can uh, get a feel of how big the kind of upgrade, how big does the laser have to be basically until you start getting more energy out than you put in. Um, so there are, there, there are very sophisticated um, rad hydro simulations which uh, basically qualitatively capture the physics of this and can kind of give predictions for kind of given design of a, of a capsule. Um, they're very computationally expensive and they still only kind of qualitatively uh, make predictions. Um, so the kind of goal is can we kind of uh, combine these kind of uh, qualitative predictions with the sort of the data we're getting out of the laser to give improved predictions. The kind of other case study that I'm going to discuss is uh, from kind of field of astronomical survey. So uh, here's a kind of um, example of a, a survey telescope. Rather than kind of making targeted observations of each of individual astronomical objects, uh, survey telescopes look at sort of hundreds of thousands of communes. Uh, this one's called VISTA, it's in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, it's run by the European Southern Observatory. Uh, and this is an example of the data that you get out of the telescope. So, uh, this is a survey called Video uh, PI Jarvis. Um, and the moon is kind of shown for comparison there uh, how big this patch of sky is. And each of those dots is a galaxy rather than a star. So, each of those dots is itself hundreds of millions of stars. Um, and what you'd like to, um, one of the kind of key properties that you'd like to know for those galaxies is what redshift it, is it at? Uh, um, I'm sure uh, some of you are kind of familiar with sort of Hubble's law from 100 year, years ago, basically, but um, kind of distance is proportional to redshift for galaxies, things that are further away are moving away faster. Uh, that kind of remains a kind of very core cool part of cosmology today, calculating the redshift of galaxies. Uh, so, it's a very kind of important property. Um, so the kind of traditional way of measuring the redshift of a galaxy is uh, finding the emission line, um, measuring an, an emission line of a galaxy, and if it's an emission line that you know, you know it's rest frame, and you can kind of see how much it's shifted by, and um, that gives you the redshift. Unfortunately, that's a very expensive use of telescope time, um, because it requires quite high signal to noise. An alternative, so that's what's called a, a spectroscopic redshift. An alternative uh, way of calculating redshift is what's called a photometric redshift. So rather than taking a spectrum, you just measure how bright the galaxy is in some very broad wavelength bins. So in this kind of example, you're just measuring how bright it is in those four, four bands, basically. So you could kind of would just get in this example four numbers. And can you find a kind of mapping from those four numbers uh, to a redshift? Uh, again, ideally with uncertainties. Um, and then use that number which is based on that much coarser information uh, as, your, as your galaxy redshift. So those are the kind of two, two case studies that I'm going to be looking at in this. Um, they kind of have some similarities and some differences. Uh, they're both kind of similarly dim size dimensional problems. They both kind of have input dimension of sort of around 10 dimensions. Uh, and they both kind of have an output that's uh, basically kind of 1D. Uh, so it's kind of, they're both kind of sort of regressions in sort of intermediate amounts of dimensions. Um, the galaxy redshift problem has, has much more data. Um, there, there's kind of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of galaxies where we know the real redshift, so there's a much larger training set of kind of real measurements. Uh, for the ICF problem, there's a much smaller number of kind of real measurements. There's maybe uh, only sort of, depending on how you're doing it, sort of in the order of tens of experiments that you might be able to kind of incorporate into training. Um, and even the kind of theoretical values for, for galaxy redshifts, we can kind of make a theoretical prediction uh, based on our understanding of galaxy spectra of what redshift that galaxy should be at. Um, but that's kind of sufficiently computationally tractable that you could do it for billions of galaxies if you wanted to. Whereas the uh, simulations for predicted um, ICF yield are, are, still, are still so expensive that you can kind of only do sort of thousands, tens of thousands uh, at most. Um, they're both quite similar in that they both have kind of very sharp edges and that very small, uh, although they're very small changes to the um, input parameters can kind of cause very big 
differences in the output value. Uh, and indeed for the um, redshift problem is actually multimodal. You can have galaxies of the same input parameters, um, but uh, of very different uh, redshifts. Um, they both kind of have different emphases, like uh, uh, the redshift problem, we're kind of much more worried about bias. It would be kind of catastrophic if um, all the redshifts were 1% bigger than what they actually were, um, which wouldn't be such a problem for the ICF. Um, whereas conversely for ICF, the kind of um, aim of the game is ultimately extrapolation. Um, even interpolation is kind of still a challenge, so you've got to kind of um, walk before you can run. But um, the end of the game is you'd like to be able to do extrapolations. Um, and they both have the problem that uh, the training data is not, not representative of the uh, test data. So there's kind of similarities and uh, differences in the kind of uh, input and output spaces. Uh, and finally, there are also slightly different problems in that uh, ICF is essentially an optimization problem. We want to be able to understand the parameter space so that we can kind of find, a, find an improvement. Um, the redshift problem is fundamentally a classification problem in the sense that at some point a telescope is going to give you hundreds and thousands of galaxies and you need to make a kind of redshift prediction for each of them. Uh, so there's kind of some similar actions in these problems. Um, so here I'm going to just discuss a, a sort of um, the kind of uh, regression and emulation um, approaches we've been using for these, these problems. Uh, there's kind of two kind of sides to the same coin of this is, uh, one is basically using the machine learning to kind of speed up uh, expensive simulations. Um, and the kind of other side of the coin is, uh, Taking your kind of real data and making regression using regression predictions for uh, unseen data rather than using the theoretical values, which are kind of too too close to the So the algorithm we use is uh, one developed by Ibrahim for his DFIL a few years ago uh, called GPZ, and uh, it's Gaussian process um, based um, using a kind of sparse Gaussian process that um, Ibrahim put a lot of work into, kind of make it a very uh, computationally tractable and easy to use algorithm and basically it uses uh, hundreds of small Gaussian kernels uh, kind of shown here in the picture to kind of construct the predictive function. So uh, on the kind of top left that's the that might be the uh, function that you end up constructing and you can see on the top right that it's, it's made up of these kind of three three small kernels. Um, so the, the hyperparameters of the model are uh, basically how many of those kernels you're going to have and you can kind of also um, basically kind of set priors or restrictions on uh, how you want the kind of covariances and sort of rotations of them to, to be. Uh, and then the parameters that you train for and try and find the optimal are, are the uh, kind of means and centers of those Gaussians, their amplitudes and their covariances. So that's um, kind of probably a few thousand uh, parameters for a kind of given model. Uh, and then so the kind of training process involves basically um, optimizing those few thousand parameters uh, in order to um, kind of basically fit your training data and then there's kind of an iterative process of comparing uh, to the validation data to make sure it's not uh, And that codes on, on GitHub and is, it is very easy to use. Uh, I'd emphasize that I'm, uh, although I'd hope to think that I was using machine learning in an in appropriate way, I'm not a kind of computer scientist by background. Um, so it is, I think that's a kind of important way for, important aspect for kind of physicists using machine learning. Um, another very nice feature of the algorithm is uh, that it kind of gives a very realistic uncertainty predictions in its uh, regression. Um, it does that because it kind of models both the intrinsic scatter as well as uncertainty due to lack of data. So uh, if you look at this diagram, uh, and hopefully you can see my cursor, uh, so it's kind of fit a kind of regression model to this data here. You can see that here there's loads of scatter. Um, so if you measured as an input eight, there's going to be quite a lot of uncertainty in the output get but additional data wouldn't help you in that part of parameter space there's just quite a lot of scatter whereas conversely here there's no data so um there's quite a lot of freedom in what Gaussian process um, kind of is fits the data so that basically gets, lets the algorithm give uh, very realistic um, um estimates of the uncertainty on prediction and it also lets you basically tell when you're starting to extrapolate when this when this type of uncertainty starts dominating over that type of uncertainty uh, and also you can kind of use that to kind of point you of where you might want to collect new data. Um, so for the redshift problem um, you can kind of use, use this algorithm there's um, uh, ours isn't kind of the only one you can list there's a few other groups around the world kind of using neural networks and decision trees and so on uh, 
um, but basically for um, when you've got a representative training set, uh, lower red shifts with lots of data, um, this works a treat basically. Um, and so you can see here on the plot, that's the kind of real red shift measured from the spectra uh, in this kind of expensive way in the x-axis. And on the y-axis is uh, the galaxy red shift um, predicted. Um, you tra trained on some data, it kind of lines on that line. So you're basically getting a very accurate estimate. Um, so, so far so good. Um, more realistically, however, um, the training data is not normally representative because um, when telescopes are used to take these, these spectra, um, one, it's harder to take um, spectra of certain types of galaxies when they're faint or, or colors, et cetera. Um, but they're also kind of done in kind of strange ways because with different biases to the rest of the data because people have chosen to take the spectra for specific sun schools. So the training data is kind of samples the population of all possible galaxies. In a very different way um, and there's also so there's that problem and there's also the fact that once you kind of start to get to high red shifts you, you start to get a degeneracy that um, some galaxies can kind of start to have the um, same um, different red shifts of the same color uh, so to kind of investigate this we um, tried to account to construct two data sets where we had the kind of true, true red shift for both of them um, but they had very different kind of Samplings from the, the uh, input parameter space. So these are kind of two different patches of the SCARME and kind of observed at the same uh, wavelengths, but very different samplings uh, over the parameter space. Uh, in particular, you can see that this orange one, which we're kind of model uh, test data, has much more galaxies out to the high redshift uh, that aren't present in the what we're going to use as the input data, uh, this cosmos field. Uh, so this is much more like a, a kind of realistic. Um, challenge might look like uh, trained on this problem. So the x-axis is the kind of true redshift and the y-axis is um, kind of predicted uh, photometric redshift. Uh, you can see for lots of data you still get it get it accurate but you kind of struggle uh, a lot with these higher redshift ones. Uh, so we kind of tried to see if we could somehow uh, account for these different um, distributions um, and see if you can kind of at least mitigate somehow um, against this. Uh, so what we did was basically model the distributions of the um, training and the test data sets uh, using a Gaussian model. So this is basically uh, a kind of unsupervised machine learning model that um, uses a sum of Gaussians to kind of represent the distribution. And it kind of uses a sort of base factor thing to decide how many mixtures is appropriate. But basically, you kind of end up with a sort of um, just a model of the distribution in input space of the galaxies. Uh, so the top left is the kind of distribution of the training data. Uh, the middle plot is the distribution of the test data. And then the bottom plot is the test data colored by the ratio. So uh, basically, the uh, uh, red points is points that there's lots in the uh, test data, but not very much in the training data, uh, and vice versa. Uh, so basically, we tried to um, account for the, these differences um, uh, in our redshift predictions, uh, and there was kind of a few different ways that we've kind of explored for that. Um, um, but basically, we kind of found that the best way was if you kind of tried to model each of these populations separately and kind of run the algorithm separately for each of these uh, mixtures that made up the population, you can kind of get some better results, uh, and that's what I show there. Um, so this is what we were kind of able to achieve. Plot on the left is kind of uh, not trying, is, is if you don't account for the fact that there's these different distributions in input space of the training and test data. Uh, and on the right is, is kind of when you've, when you've kind of done a bit to account. So you can't do it perfectly, but um, you do get um, respectable uh, improvements at higher redshifts without ruining lower redshifts. Uh, and this is kind of achieved without any um, extra input data, any additional data from the training set. So, uh, that was a kind of result we were quite pleased with. Um, uh, for coping with the bimodality, uh, I'm only going to very briefly mention this, but um, all of that so far is basically point estimates with that uncertainties, but um, more realistically, they're probably uh, multi mole distributions. So, um, Eurim's done some work um, kind of going beyond the paradigm of thinking it a bit as sort of an output value as a function of some input values, and more kind of thought of it as rather than mapping n to 1 thinking of it as an n plus one dimensional space and uh, modeling that with a Gaussian mixed model 
and then if maybe you're any parameters that you're missing you can kind of get that by marginalizing over um everything for the parameters that you do know uh, and this is an example of some output for that so uh who is the true value of the redshift and the kind of red is the output pdf um if you tried if you just kind of tried to make a point estimate you would have said this blue curve perhaps um so you've got kind of gone from this black curve that is forced to have very large um error bars because there's these kind of two peaks in the data to kind of correctly capturing that there's two um two possible values basically that the, the galaxy could have had for its red um so that's kind of the regression as a point to predicting um galaxy redshifts uh for this problem of uh, ICF yield. Um, there's not enough experiments for you to kind of do the exercise that you can do enough um, simulations that you can then kind of do regression and get the kind of understanding of the parameter space. Um, that has some slightly different features. Uh, one kind of interesting aspect of it for not all parts of parameters basically kind of equal now. So uh, this kind of cartoon shows the kind of what you might be interested in. The x axis is the uh, energy you're kind of putting in basically. Uh, and the y-axis is how much energy you're getting out. So there's kind of a big, big sharp cliff. Um, we, we're kind of very interested in kind of where that cliff is and what's kind of happening there. Whereas down at kind of lower energies, it's not nearly as interesting uh, because you kind of know it's very obvious down here that you're going to get a very low amount of energy to it. So um, you kind of need a way of telling the algorithm that you only get points basically for making good predictions in this part of parameter space. It can't, the algorithm can't sort of feel that it's done a good job by getting 99% accuracy here and then these ones all wrong. Uh, so we kind of incorporate that into, into the training as well by kind of basically upweighting the interesting parts of parameter space. Um, which I've kind of shown here. Um, so this shows that. So now we're, uh, our kind of training data is um, several thousand ICF simulations. The parameters are the parameters that describe the design of the, the capsules that go into the laser. Uh, the output value is the um, predicted energy yield in the simulation. And we're training GPZ to reproduce what the simulation would have said, basically. So from the left shows that uh, you can indeed uh, kind of emulate that quite well. Uh, the central pl plot kind of shows uh, when we've kind of upweighted the high yield parts of parameter spaces. So it allows itself to not worry so much about the lower yield parts of parameter space, basically, um, to the benefit of trying to make sure it really does get the high yield correct. Uh, and the bottom of that shows a neural network for comparison. Uh, this kind of shows the bias and RMSC of these predictions. So, again, in particular, comparing the uh, red to the blue, uh, red does indeed kind of do the best across the board. Um, but blue does better at the kind of more interesting bits of parameter space at the cost of getting them wrong at lower, less interesting parts of parameter space. Um, so basically, what the advantage of kind of doing this exercise is once you've built up your understanding of this parameter space, you can then uh, ask all sorts of kind of questions about it that weren't possible before. Um, the kind of whole idea of doing sort of large numbers of ICF simulations has kind of only come out the kind of last three or four years um, before people would kind of just do like one or two simulations. So um, this is kind of a bit of a new approach to how people design these. Um, and uh, Professor Brown uh, highlighted uh, uh, put a lot of the work at Lawrence Livermore uh, in I think the first of these uh, seminar series last, last term. Uh, and I think we're getting uh, some of the more, I'm giving a talk some of the work uh, later this time as well. Um, so it's, it's kind of been an area that's, that's been expanding. Um, but once you've kind of done this regression, basically you can ask lots of questions about the uh, design space that you couldn't before. So uh, these three plots show as a function of um, a kind of 2D slice through your 5D design space. Uh, and the one on the left, how much energy you're getting out. Uh, so you can kind of see where the kind of highest yield part of parameter space is. The central plot kind of shows your uncertainty. So you can kind of see where there's high uncertainty, where there's low uncertainty in the design space. And the third plot shows um, where you're kind of extrapolating. So you can kind of see in that yellow region, that's where you're kind of starting to, to extrapolate. Um, so you can then ask, ask all sorts of questions like, obviously the kind of simplest one is, what part of the design space gives the highest yield? Um, but you can also kind of ask questions based on understanding of physics that the model doesn't incorporate. So for example, 
these are 1D simulations, but maybe you know that um, Raleigh Taylor instabilities kind of mess it up in 3D. If the gas fill density gets too low, so you might say, well, what's the optimum about keeping the gas fill above a certain um, limit, all sorts of things like that. So um, we kind of basically try to find what was the kind of ludicrously robust um, design that would kind of still give moderate yields, um, even if you kind of gave it loads of perturbations. And um, this is what we kind of came up with. Um, Livermore will have a, a kind of more um, uh, an approach where they kind of uh, kind of change much more of the kind of knobs that um, knobs and um, dials of the, the laser, basically. And they find uh, what I think is a kind of really interesting result of uh, the kind of first sort of novel ICF design and learning rather than a sort of human designer's intuition and they kind of ended up with this um, uh, non-spherically symmetric capsule um, which um, under kind of certain conditions it uh, hopefully is um, uh, quite a robust, robust design and maybe um, you'll hear more about that in the, the talk more in a few weeks time. Um, so that's the kind of two case studies and then I'm just going to briefly mention there's also this kind of idea of using machine learning regression to look up tables so the idea of that is maybe you've got one of these kind of mega um, uh, hydrodynamic simulations and you've kind of got some, some sub uh, routine within that that's extremely computationally expensive um, using machine learning to kind of replace that hopefully. Uh, so you would do loads of simulations of that kind of expensive sub module and then train your algorithm to reproduce that and then your simulation kind of calls that instead. Um, so it's just done a small amount of work with that. Um, this is kind of project with First Light Fusion, which is a startup company in Oxford uh, that have their own particular spin on uh, nuclear fusion. And one of the problems that's computation expensive in their, uh, in their um, code is uh, something called the Riemann problem. So uh, we kind of trained GPZ to reproduce uh, what their kind of fluid dynamics code would have said for that problem. Um, you can kind of see it there. So it's basically a trade off of GPZ is. Uh, well, faster than, uh, than solving it properly, but of course it's not perfectly accurate. Um, so there's kind of ongoing work to see whether um, that's kind of worth doing or not. But that's potentially one um, one pathway to kind of speeding up simulations. And then once you kind of sped up the simulations, you can do much more of them and then you can kind of optimize your design much more easily. Uh, and I'm just going to briefly mention uh, Mohamed Kazan, who uh, I think is in the in the call. Uh, he's done some done some amazing work on building a kind of more, much more sophisticated uh, emulator. Um, I've kind of only been talking sort of n to one sort of mapping space, but his his work is kind of uh, able to sort of do sort of scalars, vectors, and images uh, to other scalars, vectors, and images, and kind of much more uh, um, kind of versatile. Um, and that's kind of a neural network based, but optimizes the architecture of the neural network as well as the kind of weights uh, at the same time. So I would say very much more about about that. Um, I'm sure you can ask him. But it's on archive, uh, and he's, he's kind of shown can reproduce uh, problems in a, from a, all across physics, including uh, ICF and astrophysics, um, to a high degree of, of um, accuracy. Um, I believe he's looking at kind of incorporating this into um, making simulations across across the board much faster. So uh, all of that is kind of basically sort of regression, where you're kind of um, sort of interpolating between. Um, the gaps basically on your data sets. So I'm now going to talk about um, kind of situations of kind of combining the sort of machine learning prediction and the kind of prediction based on theory and can you combine them somehow for improved predictions. Um, so for the galaxy redshift problem, uh, this is an example from uh, Ken Duncan um, a few years ago. Uh, the figure on the left uh, basically shows how well uh, you can kind of predict galaxy redshifts and um, based on uh, it's called template fitting but it's basically using our theoretical knowledge of what galaxy spectra should look like to predict um, what the redshift of the galaxy is uh, and the central plot is kind of using the machine learning method I've, I've described um, thus far uh, so you can kind of see uh, the kind of theory method does does quite well out to high redshifts um, but it kind of gets some wrong and there's maybe a bit more scatter here. The machine learning method does really well here where there's lots of data, uh, does much more precise than template methods, uh, but then starts to fail where there's less training data up here. Uh, and then this is a kind of uh, um, combination of them 
where you kind of try and take the, the best of both worlds, basically. And you can kind of see at these red shifts, it kind of takes the um, high quality machine learning predictions. But then at, once you get to high red shift, it knows that the machine learning predictions aren't very good. And it kind of reverts to the theoretical prediction. Uh, so overall, these are kind of much better. You can see you can get a much, much more improved um, predictions. Uh, and this is kind of show, shows statistically what that looks like. Uh, the x-axis is basically um, faintness of the galaxy. So on the right are really faint galaxies, on the left are really bright galaxies. Um, and you can see that the kind of uh, combined prediction is much better than either the uh, theory or the machine learning based prediction by themselves. Um, people have also started doing this for, for ICF. So um, this is a study by um, from LLE. And this is, I think, the first uh, kind of real experiment that's kind of resulted from the kind of data driven approach to ICF. And uh, uh, unfortunately, for the figure on the bottom left, they're plotted it the, the other way around to normal, but the y axis is the kind of real experimental measured uh, energy yield, and the x axis is what predicted. So they basically kind of use something similar to the, the, this kind of surrogate idea. They've got a model that will just reproduce what the simulation would have said, and then they just allow it to be kind of uh, corrected by pa power laws, and they kind of just constrain uh, these power law corrections um, in this equation here. Um, so even that, that relatively simple correction, they can still kind of go from these red points to these blue points of them all being on the line. Uh, and I, uh, I think the uh, they call it validation data, but I think the validation data is, is what I've been calling test data. Uh, and they kind of use that to calibrate the model to uh, guide themselves to a, a high yield. So they got the, the record uh, yield on that uh, laser is currently kind of done with this uh, data driven approach. Um, kind of another, another tack that's been used in the US for um, combining, combining what kind of theory and data is transfer learning. So this is a um, for situations where you've got a kind of problem with very scarce, uh, only a very small amount of data, but you've got a kind of related problem where there's loads of data on. Um, so in this situation, the kind of simulated data is where we've got loads of data, but then it's the kind of experimental data is when we've kind of only got a little bit of data. So they're kind of the kind of strategy taken there. It's uh, on the left here, you've got your simulation outputs as function of inputs. Uh, you train your network on that, so then the neural network is reproducing the simulation results. You then maybe got a tiny number of experiments, and you're kind of assuming that um, your simulation is kind of qualitatively, just not quantitatively, capturing all physics. And basically, you um, freeze most of the network, but retrain just a little bit of it, and hopefully, and retrain that on your on the experiments. And hopefully, this kind of, that kind of gives you a, a kind of hybrid. Um, that kind of incorporates the knowledge and simulation, but also the data from experiments to give you improved predictions. Um, and they've kind of done this with real experiments. Um, they actually kind of did this in three stages, so they kind of had a, a kind of really cheap simulation. Um, they could do sort of do tens of thousands for, you know, kind of more, more complex simulation, I think that they could only do a few hundred. And then experiments where they only have 25 experiments. Uh, and you can see that top, top figure there is kind of five outputs you're trying to predict, um, and it goes from the kind of blue to the red to the yellow. Um, and you can see but by, by the time it's kind of been trained on, on some real experiments as well, the yellow dots with the black circles on um, is kind of test data that it hadn't seen before. It's now able to make um, good predictions for those. Um, so I think there's kind of questions about uh, to what degree you'd kind of trust the extrapolations from this, um, but I think this works, works extremely well as a, Kind of interpolative me method um, and I think this kind of re really nice figure from this paper at the bottom there um, what the kind of algorithm believes is the optimum design both the kind of capsule and uh, the kind of laser pulse that should be used uh, and you can kind of see that it kind of changes at each stage once it gets more information of a different type it kind of changes what it thinks is the optimum uh, experimental design uh, and then finally um, um, for kind of getting some extrapolative power, they've kind of uh, done some work making, restricting these uh, surrogates to kind of obey physical models. So um, basically they've done uh, loads of simulations, both overall design space and allowing the physics to change, but only in a kind of physically reasonable way. And then basically sort of done MCMC 
kind of constrain those parameters uh, based on uh, seven experiments. Uh, so you kind of end up with sort of Bayesian constraints for all these parameters, uh, and then you kind of end up with a sort of uh, extrapolation that kind of respects all the physics, um, but sort of also kind of fits the experimental data you've got. Um, so two and, um, 200 kilojoules is the kind of current size of the biggest laser, so they're trying to see sort of how, how big do you, do you need the laser to be before you um, um, break even. And uh, I'm sure, that, I'm sure uh, uh, the speaker in a few weeks' time will have much more to, to say about this. Um, so um, that's the kind of bulk of the talk. I'm just going to talk about two or three uh, much smaller uh, kind of projects that link into this uh, now. Um, First, in terms of the kind of design of these things, um, all of this has so far assumed that you've kind of got your basic design and you're kind of trying to optimize it within your kind of five dimensional parameter space. Um, I was kind of interested in how can you kind of find that basic design because kind of like the space of all possible things that you could, you could put on it is, is, is really large, sort of more like hundreds of dimensions. Um, so I have done a bit of investigation of even kind of genetic algorithms, uh, where you kind of have population designs and calculate their yield and then you kind of make the uh, high yield uh, designs with each other and uh, give them mutations and so on uh, and this this is what that kind of looks like um, without going too much into the specifics of it kind of design that I ended up with so and that's um, for the people um, who can know about the ICF that's not not a million miles from a kind of um, uh, classic design so that's kind of quite comforting but my kind of uh, kind of the next stage of working on this is that it will be kind of uh, um, the, this kind of surrogate building process will be com combined with the optimization rather than you kind of um, doing the optimization just in that smaller parameter space. Um, another reason why people are kind of starting to think about machine learning for uh, high powered lasers is that the amount of data is going to increase quite a lot. So uh, the x axis here is um, basically how many times the laser can fire per second. Uh, and the y-axis is energy, so um, the National Ignition Facility is firing today basically, but a huge amount of energy, so that's up here on the, the top left. Um, but there's also lasers that are kind of much less energy, but are starting to fire a huge amount of time per second. And um, the kind of energies and data rates are kind of increase, basically, going to increase basically. In particular, um, these x facilities are now starting to get to really high, high data rates. Um, I've kind of put the LHC on um, there for comparison. It's the kind of energy scales aren't directly comparable, but just to kind of to, to kind of get across the idea that um, some of these laser facilities are going to start to look much more like a sort of high data rate accelerator rather than a kind of one um, doing one individual um, shot that gives you lots of information. It's just a kind of one-off experiment. Uh, doing large numbers of experiments is in, in a campaign is going to become uh, well, is, is, is already becoming the norm. Uh, and you're going to have to sort of start having some sort of automated control of these lasers. Um, and I've just kind of given there two examples there, one with uh, a genetic algorithm kind of controlling the laser, uh, another one with a sort of Bayesian optimization controlling the, the laser parameters. Um, uh, okay. I think uh, almost a lot of um, been investigating uh, the idea of unknown unknowns. So, um, there's no knowns, as we know. There's the um, known, um, known unknowns, but also there's probably some unknown unknowns. So when we're kind of trying to extrapolate what this laser behavior is going to look like for a, for a much bigger laser, how do we know that there's not going to be some unknown physics that we kind of haven't anticipated? And um, there's kind of two papers that I mentioned that are kind of trying to um, uh, understand the system and they basically kind of revolve around introducing extra parameters that kind of describe your unknown systematics and if you've got a few independent probes of the physics you can kind of constrain how big these unknown systematics can be so uh, I think to some degree it's kind of an ill-posed problem and if all of your probes have the same unknown systematic then you, you, you're kind of out of luck really um, but I think doing kind of methods like this can, can give you have the potential to give much more uh, realistic uncertainties than we, we sometimes use. Uh, and kind of finally, just to kind of link, uh, this really is the final point, uh, kind of link the um, kind of two sides of the, this talk. Um, all the kind of things I described with ICF uh, can of course also be done for these 
uh, laboratory astrophysics experiments that you can do. So you could kind of imagine using your um, experiments to kind of probe certain uh, astrophysical processes and then kind of training a kind of model uh, of the microphysics calibrated by the experiment. And then when you're kind of interpreting your astronomical measurements, um, why not use this kind of experimentally calibrated model rather than theoretical values? Um, this is an example from a paper by uh, Sousa last year, where they kind of found uh, the DT reaction rate was a little bit different to the kind of conventional values. So um, if you just needed to know what the reaction rate was and you kind of weren't, weren't interested in the kind of theory behind that, then there was no reason you couldn't use this kind of data-driven uh, modeling or uh, astronomical model. Uh, and this is finally just like a little cartoon of my kind of idea for that is uh, the kind of as you start, as these lasers start to be able to fire sort of millions of times rather than one or two times, you can kind of build up a kind of um, uh, model trained on the laboratory astrophysics data and then kind of combine that with your astronomical observations uh, and hopefully you can kind of get improved, improved predictions with, with realistic uncertainties based on that. Uh, so just to conclude, um, uh, I'll summarize some ongoing work in Oxford uh, developing regression tools and applying them to uh, physics problems in particular. I've discussed two case studies of galaxy redshifts and inertial confinement fusion. Uh, I've also uh, discussed a few ways people have explored kind of combining machine learning predictions and theoretical predictions. Uh, and finally, I just gave kind of a few, few smaller um, um, projects on how um, these kind of surrogates are kind of linking to other um, data science problems within the, the data. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. All right. Um, thank you, Peter. Um, um, so at this point, I think it's it's time for some questions. Um, so you can just unmute yourself and um, and ask uh, straight away. That that's fine. Hello, Peter. Um, thanks for the nice talk. Um, one question I I had is in the beginning. Um, you said that the redshift was. Um, a classification problem compared to an extrapolation problem for the ICF, I think. Um, how does the classification work? Because later on, it mainly seems that you're trying to predict the redshift with um, with the information you have. Uh, so I, I guess I guess I, what I was trying to highlight there is that uh, they're both extrapolation problems to some degree in that. Um, uh, for both of them, you might want to um, either know when you're extrapolating or um, kind of quantify your extrapolation. I guess what I was trying to emphasize with the classification is that for the galaxy problem, um, we're eventually going to use telescopes to sort of take data on sort of a few hundred thousand galaxies. And we, we don't get to choose what properties those galaxies have, and we need to make a prediction for them. Whereas conversely, for the ICF year problem, um, there's not that much, no one's ever going to, we get to choose basically what experiments are done um, and you want to kind of choose them in optimum places. There's not going to be eventually be a kind of set of ICF experiments that we just want to predict the outcome for. Does that make sense? Yes, thanks, that makes sense. Um, uh, I had a, a follow-up question a bit, um, which is, so you, you use the Gaussian processes, um, so I, I was going to ask, did you compare it with classification algorithms like a boosted decision tree and so on, but I think it's still more kind of a regress the regression problem. So did you then compare it with um, neural networks, and is the main reason you chose for the Gaussian processes the fact that you can easily access this uncertainty? Yeah, so um, the I got a variety of reasons, but uh, I guess the, the main reason we used Gaussian processes was that we got, um, uh, to try and get these realistic uncertainties that we thought this this kind of idea of the two types of uncertainty was kind of useful. Uh, I guess more broadly, uh, the redshift problem has been studied in the context of machine learning for uh, uh, probably at least ten years, and people have kind of tried. Gaussian processes, neural networks, um, decision trees, and um, self-organizing maps, and a large number of things. Um, I can't remember the top of my head, but if, if you're interested, you can look at papers and people have done comparisons, including the code that we've used, and you can kind of see that Gaussian, pro Gaussian our code does better at some aspects of it than others. Um, neural networks manage to capture other, other aspects. 
Um, I guess another aspect that we quite liked about the gassing process is, is that um, uh, there may be a bit more, you have a better control of the prior over the space of functions in that we, we at least can kind of um, uh, control the prior over the space of possible functions, whereas for a neural network, you maybe have less control um, for a given architecture of what your prior neural function is going to be. Um, for the ICF problem, um, uh, I think there's maybe, a, I think it's kind of only our group in Oxford and this group in Livermore that have uh, used machine learning for the problem, to my knowledge. And uh, they kind of use neural networks and uh, either go using Gaussian processes partially just to be different. But again, I think for this reason that Gaussian processes probably get part of it right and neural networks probably get different bits of it right and hopefully you can kind of make some progress by combining them somehow. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I had one more. So you showed this hybrid uh, hybrid approach. Um, so um, I assume that you're kind of taking some superposition of the the classical model with the machine learning model. Is the weight that you give to your um, Gaussian process model uh, purely deduced from this uncertainty that you got on this Gaussian problem, or do you do something more by hand? Are you saying for this? For this, how is this done? Uh, well, to, to combine both, so how do you decide um, which of the two um, predictions that weights the most in your hybrid approach to use the uncertainty of the Gaussian process model? Yeah, uh, so I was I wasn't in the paper, so no 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 credit to me. So uh, Ken Duncan been in light at the time, I think still there. But, um, uh, so the kind of the simplest thing you can do is do something like maybe for each gamut. So for each, you've got a probability distribution from machine learning and a probability distribution from theory. Um, the kind of zeroth order thing you can do is just say, oh, okay, I'll take the one with the smallest error bar and say that's my answer. Um, people have done done that, and that does work a little bit. Uh, and then various other things of sort of like averaging the PDFs and so on. Uh, I believe what uh, Duncan done, does here is basically give each um, uh, galaxy a give each method a probability of being correct, basically, um, and then uh, margin like, has that kind of as an unknown, I think. So if the, ki if the kind of two probable distributions overlap, then that kind of gives, gives increased confidence and um, it allows them to um, kind of multiply the distributions to get a much narrower peak, basically. Whereas if they're quite far apart, then that increases the probability that uh, they're wrong basically, and you kind of get a much broader peak with lots of lots of peaks in it basically. Um, I think that's how he does it. Okay, thanks. All right, any any other questions? And if you are asking a question, please make sure you're you're not muted. That would be good. Okay, maybe I have um, I have one more. Um, so for the inertial confinement fusion, um, you're basically predicting um, good values for um, next experiments. I was wondering if so. I assume that also these kind of parameters have some uncertainty on them. Um, are you can you do with such a kind of model a prediction of how important the uncertainty on your measurement is? Like for example, that you could have an incentive to improve some kind of diagnostic in instrumentation of your experiment because you can see that your model would perform a lot better if you do so? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so there, the, there's, a, there's a large number of uncertainties here in that there's, there's the kind of, I can't remember the name of it, there's the kind of physics uncertainty of what would happen, but there's also the uncertainty in the sense that um, when they kind of um, send out their instructions uh, for how big the ablator is, for example, it comes back from the manufacturer, but they won't have built it perfectly. Uh, and there's like hundreds of parameters that are effectively unknown as well on the input. Um, so the, the short answer is, uh, and yes, we've kind of been, and it would be really helpful to know because you can say, oh, well, if it's the ablator, then you need to tell the manufacturer that well, that's really critical. Make sure you don't get it, um, the uncertainty of that wrong. Um, the short answer is yes, we're trying to incorporate that, um, and I think the Livermore group is as well, but I don't know that we've um, 
kind of definitively got it exactly as you say, or broken down the uncertainty from each of the parameters. Um, part, to some degree, um, that's what you can kind of do with, with these two. Um, what we both, what both of the, these papers we kind of did was say, uh, this equation here, um, so C was the quantity that they optimized. Um, ITFX was uh, basically the energy is, is, is modified here, but that's basically the sort of measurement of high yield. And then they have this quantity 10P, and P is uh, probability um, that the yield is still big if you give it a perturbation. And then the perturbation is basically, as you say, giving a modification to what if the capital thickness was actually a little bit different to what you thought it was and so on, you end up picking a bit of parameter space that still gives you a high number, even if the density was a little bit different to what you thought. Um, so I don't think um, anyone's kind of got anything quite as you say, breaking down the uncertainty by each individual parameter, but we have kind of tried to include stuff like that in the analysis. Okay, thanks. All right. Um... If there's no more questions, I guess we can we can thank the speaker either by unmuting and clapping, or you can use like reactions uh, as like a clap option uh, if you'd like to do that. So uh, thank you, Peter, for your um, for your talk. Um, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for for connecting as well.